Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full show times, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. The show is a proud media partner for the 11th Annual Media Excellence Awards, which are produced by Access Entertainment in Los Angeles, California. The Media Excellence Awards are recognized as the most influential awards show, honoring innovation and leadership in all things mobile entertainment, lifestyle, and technology. For more information on how to submit to these awards, please visit MediaXAwards.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Damien Wassel. He's the CEO and publisher at Vault Comics. Damien, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Kevin. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm, I'm doing very well. Yourself? Doing good. It's been a good morning. Yeah, that's good, man. That's good. So I'm excited to have you on the show. I think what you guys are doing at Vault Comics is actually quite fascinating, and you guys have done a lot in the last um, couple of years, but maybe before we get into all that stuff, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Um, yeah, so I grew up, I was born in Annapolis, Maryland, okay. uh, not far from the South River. I okay. spent a lot of time as a child on the South and Severn Rivers in Annapolis. Sure. And then when I was nine, we moved to uh, the northern part of Virginia, but by no means northern Virginia, so not the D.C. metro sprawl. We were out uh, at the the edge of cattle country in Fauquier County, uh, a name we had a lot of fun with in high school. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I can imagine. Could imagine. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. And uh, Yeah, so I grew up between, you know, like the Chesapeake and the mountains of Virginia and had a lot of fun outside as a kid. And uh, I, when I lived in Virginia, you know, my parents had divorced at that point, but they both had very remote homes. So okay. I spent a whole lot of time in the woods with very little other than, you know, like books to, to keep me busy. Interesting. So you went to university. What did you take and why? Um, so I went to undergrad at the College of William and Mary okay. in Virginia in god awful Colonial Williamsburg. <laughs> and, uh, I, the, so the first time you you know you see a guy in a tricornered hat driving a geo in the parking lot of a food line, it's funny. And the hundredth time you see the same guy, you you feel bad for him. I got um, you. Interesting. <laughs> I studied philosophy and math in undergrad, and then I went on to teach mathematics for a few years at the high school and middle school level before going back and doing a doctorate in philosophy at the University of Michigan. Okay, interesting. What made you want to take that? Well, I think for a long time I had really wanted to be a research academic. Okay. Uh, I, I still love that work. You know, I regularly read philosophy and mathematics journals in my free time. Okay. Um, but as I was in graduate school, I also, you know, started laying the groundwork for the, the business that became Vault with, with my brother and uh, got a little disenchanted with the life of university academic and in 2018 so i decided to to take a different path interesting so walk me through how vault comics came to be well vault comics well uh my brother cousin nathan father and i had spent a while uh you know creating some graphic novels and other illustrated books okay just in our our spare time kind of thing yeah, in our spare time, okay, and self-published some of those, and we uh, through business connections of my dad's, we we managed to find some funding to make a more serious effort of that, and some of these titles that we self-published, um, you know, they were very critically acclaimed, okay. but we didn't find the kind of commercial success with them that we wanted to, but along the way we saw you know, a market opportunity for a strong genre focused brand in, in the direct market in the comic book market and the graphic novel market broadly construed. And, uh, you know, we, we did some learning and built some connections we felt we could use to take a serious crack at it. And so, 
you know, we started a hatching schemes for vault in the maybe around March of 2016. And we announced the, the brand and its first few titles in July of 2016. And then the first books hit shelves in uh, February of 2017. Okay. So very right cool. now we're what uh, some 20 months into releasing titles. Very cool. So do you want to be, want to walk us through kind of some of those titles and, and um, kind of genres that you guys actually put comics out in? Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, first apologies to my editorial staff. We do a much better job pitching any of these books. Than it's I all will. good, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the first book we put out uh, to, you know, to noteworthy reception is a title called Heathen. Okay. Um, which has subsequently been optioned for film by Constantine, the European media company that brought you the much loved Resident Evil films. Very cool, um, man. That's huge. Yeah, that was a that was our first first major win on the film okay. and TV side, so, and you know, set set in motion. How did that come oh, kind of come to be? Because like, how did that, he even come to be with Vault, or how did the film deal come to be? Well, a bit of both, I guess. Like, how did you come up with the idea originally, and then basically, like, how did you get the film and TV kind of stuff? Because I think that's basically anybody's dream, right? And to kind of come out of the gate and do that is is a huge deal. Uh, well, thank you for saying so. Uh, he then came to us. So I, I have the privilege of working, uh, you know, day to day beside one of the very best designers in, in the history of the comic book and graphic novel medium, a guy named Tim Daniel. Okay. And Tim's worked with everyone in the business. How did you meet him? Just out of curiosity. Sorry, I keep setting us on a tangent, but I am curious. Tim also uh, lives in Missoula, Montana. He worked okay. for a long time for the University of Montana before coming on board okay. full time with Vault, and he he had done comic book design work. Um, you know, af after work and in the evenings, it was passion for him. Got gotcha. you. And he's also a, a you know a writer and an extraordinarily gifted writer and, and creator of comics on his own. Okay. And so we met him. Year, my brother Adrian met him at a signing where Adrian was signing one of our earlier graphic novels and Tim Very was cool. signing his uh, his comic book series Enormous and we got to know one another and started working together in a you know uh, piecemeal way and then you know Tim gradually became one of our uh, you know most valued partners here at Bolt and so Tim came he then came across Tim's desk by way of a really good friend of his who's worked for a long time for Skybound and a couple other publishers. And then Tim sent it over to us. And, you know, the, the, the pitch on Heathen is it's about a lesbian Viking who decides to kill Odin to end the patriarchy. I mean, it's, it's a pretty compact elevator pitch. It's got a very clear audience. Sure. Uh, it's a beautiful book. Natasha Alterisi, the writer and artist, is you know the sort of singular talent in comics uh, today. There are very few people who can both script and and draw a book with that level of that sure. level of facility. Her pages are gorgeous. And so the moment I read the first issue, which by this point had been uh, published in print by a, a very small but really, really great local press in, in Oklahoma where Natasha is from and been fairly successful in comicsology, but hadn't seen national distribution in print. The moment I read that first issue, I said, oh, I really want to get this book. And we you know, reached out to Natasha and got the book under contract at Vault, lined it up as one of our, our launch titles. And, you know, it launched to really excellent sales. The first issue went to four printings at this point, the trade paperback. Um, collecting the first four issues has, has gone to three printings. Um, Natasha has been unfortunately dealing with some some wrist uh, repetitive stress injuries that have slowed her output. But the second volume is nearing completion right now, and you know pre sales on that are very strong. And so we had this you know this book that I think was very timely, and in so far as any book about you know magical lesbian Vikings could possibly be also very topical. You know, it came out at a time when feminist issues sure. were coming to the fore in the you know, 
daily news in a way that they hadn't for, you know, they, they probably hadn't since, you know, sometime around 1996. Um, and it was, it was just a great confluence of things that pushed that book to be a, a tremendous success in print. And it's, uh, for all, you know, for all the grandeur of a story about a woman trying to kill a god king, it's a pretty mm-hmm. compact, very character-driven story. Sure. So it's exactly the kind of uh, the kind of story that ports well to other media. Um, and while we were self-publishing before Vault launched in the days of our earlier business, we put together a really great. Um, team of people on the entertainment side. So we started working with an excellent uh, entertainment attorney, a guy named Matt Sugarman, who works at a a firm called Weintraub Tobin, which is a big, you know, like Southern California powerhouse law firm. Interesting. And he introduced us to a a gentleman named F.J. DeSanto, who is now like an extremely dear friend of mine, Matt and F.J. both, you know, been with us for for years. And I, I couldn't speak more highly of them. Um, FJ is a now independent producer who worked for a long time for um, the guy who owns all the film rights to Batman. Wow. Uh, Michael <laughs> Uslan. And so FJ had, you know, like laid the groundwork for his own later stage as, uh, as an independent producer, having worked for a while with somebody else. And um, he came on board to help us oversee all of our film and TV development. So by the time we had Heathen, you know, we had a, a great team in place wow. to take advantage of of those sorts of you know those sorts of gems in our catalog. And through a mutual connection of FJ's and Tim Daniels, a guy named Adrian Ascaria, we we managed to line up a buyer on Heathen without you know without a package. So we came in on that and you know sold the sold the film option on that without any, any talent attached. And they immediately uh, commissioned a writer. Um, and I actually just, you know, just got the chance to read her first screenplay draft not long ago. And, um, you know, it was, it was great. It was absolutely great. So I'm very excited. No, that's, that's really cool, man. Like that's huge, right. To kind of come out like, like, like that. Right. And so walk me through, because you guys have a ton of other comics. Do you want to talk about some others and, and kind of some of the other kind of genres that you guys have comics in? Absolutely. So um, Vault is a science fiction and fantasy focused press. Okay. So we're you know, a genre focused publisher. Okay. Um, we publish anything and everything that can fit under those banners. So that okay. ranges from, you know, like nostalgic, B horror kind of titles that fit the like old sci-fi creature feature okay. uh, style of, of, um, you know, the subgenre. So we have a, a series I love, um, called return to whisper uh, written by Elliot Ray Hall that fits that banner Okay. to, um, you know, and that ranges to uh, sword and sorcery fantasy. We have a you know, really great series called songs for the dead about a young woman who is a necromancer who makes friends with a somewhat older woman who's really good at killing people and okay. they, they have an adventure. Interesting. And that comes, that comes out uh, in trade paperback next week. Very so, cool. I, you know, that I think would appeal to anyone who liked heathen. Um, and then, you know, we have like, uh, you know, space faring adventures like vagrant queen by Meg Passaggio or wasted space. Um, by Mike Marisi and Hayden Sherman. And, uh, you know, like Wasted Space is another favorite of mine. It's trade paperback is due out next week. It, it's, you know, this is one of those situations where I love everything we publish. Some of what we publish, you know, is, is more a book for me than sure. some of the other things we publish. And, sure. and Wasted Space is, you know, like very much a book for a reader like me, someone who grew up on, uh, you know, reading every piece of science fiction they could get their hands on. And sort of laughing at the ridiculous elements of even the most self-serious uh, science fiction, and you know, wasted space just sort of looks that all squarely, uh, squarely in the eye. So it's about this guy who is a washed-up former prophet, 
having heard the voice of this deity like entity in his head called the creator and, and helped put a horrible Trump like autocrat in power over the galaxy who decides that he needs to come out of his, you know, drunken, drunken midlife crisis and try to fix the, <laughs> the wrongs of his earlier days. And, uh, you know, it's a little like Garth Ennis's preacher meets star Wars and, uh, just irreverent and hilarious. And also, you know, really topical and, uh, very, very action packed. So it sort of hits all the notes for a reader like me. No, I, I think that's really cool, man. And, and just like, as I was kind of just doing a little bit more homework on all the different stuff that you guys kind of cover. Like, I must say the artwork on some of these things, like, well, all the artwork is really beautiful on, but it's all really different, right? Like, which I think is, is probably really hard to do. I, I get like people, you, you guys have like people have their own different styles, but like the artwork is really kind of beautiful in their own kind of unique way, depending on, you know, kind of the comic. Is that, is that, would you agree with that? I would completely. So, you know, we have, um, you know, we have artists who, whose work runs a, an enormous range of yeah. styles, you know, so, you know, we have a book coming out in early October from uh, absolutely brilliant writer. And, you know, he's brought in an artist who he's worked with before. Um, the the writer is, is London based and has grown up in the U S and India. The artist is from India and he's um, you know, he's managed to get this, absolutely beautiful crisp clean line style that evokes uh you know like brian boland at his best and then you know contrast that with something like heathen where natasha works by you know laying down really loose pencils and then digitally painting on top of that and sure. you, you have you know everything in between um i i weigh all of the the praise and for that at the feet of my brother adrian who is our editor-in-chief here, okay. chief creative officer, and, and the creative engine behind all of our, our output. Um, he's got an extraordinary eye for curating talent. And with Tim Daniel and our cousin Nathan, who works for us as an art director, they've managed to line up some amazing people. And then, you know, we don't have any kind of house style. Okay. We don't have some sort of, you know, house aesthetic that we're we're reaching for except to put the best version of each comic we can on the shelves and so you know there aren't we don't have people coming in and picking up characters that have pre-existing model sheets and history they have to you know hearken to and so our artists end up with you know the, the same freedom they would have working for any other independent press but then they also get an extraordinary amount of editorial support and art direction from us which I think really helps a lot of them do their their very best work here. Interesting, yeah, that's interesting because you're you're basically trying to give them complete freedom, but also kind of help them um, along the way if they kind of need it, right? Is that kind of a simple way to put that? Absolutely, yeah. You know, it's you know we think of it as critical support, right? You know, sure. they're, they're, they have the freedom to make the choices that they want to make, but you know that they, they get our feedback as as those choices are being made. And so they, you know, get some uh, support in, in figuring out the, the best way through. And, you know, we try to make sure that we keep a really active conversation going between all of the, um, all of the members of the creative teams on our books. Uh, and this is, you know, here, I'm going to, I'm going to plug a piece of technology that <laughs> makes work possible for us. This is only possible because we work with Slack uh, every day. It's, sure, I use it every day too. Yep. Spread, we've got creators spread all over the world. Very and cool. I have no idea how we would facilitate these sorts of real time conversations without something like that. You know, it would be really hard for us to do what we're doing right now, even, you know, even 10 years ago. Wow. Um, because, you know, I've got creators in six different continents. Sure. <laughs> I'm exaggerating, of course, but I creators in Europe and North America and Asia and Africa working on books with us and uh, you know, in a dozen different time zones. And that, that tool enables us to talk in, in real time as, as things are coming together. It's great. Very cool. 
Thanks for listening to Building the Future. This show is heard by more than a million people monthly in over 15 markets worldwide, including Silicon Valley. Kevin Horick's guests are leading business owners, successful entrepreneurs, and merchandisers worldwide. Now, your brand has an opportunity to tap into this dedicated and active group of business people who are looking for places to invest and the right opportunities to support. Find out how you can get involved at buildingthefutureshow.com. Like, I, this is probably um, a very kind of general question related to roughly how long does it take you guys to kind of go from concept to actually kind of release? I, I know, like, it, is there kind of a, uh, a timeline you guys try to stick within or is it kind of just like take however long you kind of need? It varies a lot okay. from book to book. So what I'll what I'll do is give you what might be a more instructive answer than to say it varies. Okay. Um, if we if we were doing it as fast as we could, so the okay. breakneck version of the process is sure. about um, eight months from wow. deal, you know, deal getting papered to first issue hitting shelves. Wow. Now that you know that's the sort of situation where there there's got to be. Uh, really experienced team on the book and like a pressing market need to get something out quickly for anybody to want to move that fast. Got you. Um, you know, it's that putting a comic book out in eight months from signing the deal to the first issue hitting shelves is, you know, that's the sort of process that isn't going to be fun for anybody. Sure. Um, Ideally, what we, we want is another four months on top of that from okay. the time we sign the deal until the time that we're, we're getting things released um, so that we're looking at a, you know, a full year. Um, and there's some, there's some components of getting a comic book into the market in, you know, through comic book stores and subsequently as a trade paperback through bookstores and comic book stores that are, um, you know, immovable for features of the environment for us. So, you know, we have to solicit books four months before they, you know, they're going to release and orders close two months before they, uh, or, you know, they rather go live in the catalog two months before they release and orders close one month before they release. And then in the, you know, for the books, bookstore releases, everything is eight months out for us. And, you know, those, we can't move any of those, uh, those features of the environment. So we have to work around them and work with them so that, you know, that's part of why we have to have a minimum of eight months to actually work gotcha. on anything. Interesting. Yeah. Like I, I think I'm just more curious cause like obviously for people that even probably like read a ton of comic books, they probably don't realize how much time and effort goes into even like one issue. Right. Uh, yeah, it's an extraordinary amount of time and effort on the part of many, many people. So, you know, the best comic books that you read often have, uh, you know, a penciler. Sometimes that penciler does their inks. Sometimes they don't. Okay. And there's a person who's going to color for them on top of their line art. Interesting. And, you know, every every page needs to get lettered and lettering you know, letterers and colorists are the unsung heroes of, of comics. Artists are amazing people and I love them, but I have seen letterers and colorists work miracles with pages full of problems. These people are extraordinarily good at what they do and they are the, they're the consummate professionals of the, the comics world as well. They, they make their income on volume. So they, they have to work fast and they have to work well. Um, and then, of course, there's an editorial staff. Every book has a writer who's working on it, sometimes several writers. There are marketing people working on the books. There are designers doing design treatments for the covers and sometimes working for on elements in the interior pages. So, you're, you know, you're talking about every every comic book you pick up has typically been worked on in a concerted and ongoing page-by-page -page way by at least four people with... Wow. You know, at, at least two or three other people working on, uh, you know, issue by issue elements. And, you know, this unfolds over many, many, many days. So, you know, a very prolific comic artist can churn out a page a day. Okay. So if you're wow. you know, looking at, uh, you know, a 22 page comic book, that's 22 days of 
labor on the part of a real human being just to draw those pages. Sure. Uh, and then, you know, it moves on to a colorist and a really, really good colorist can do about 22 pages in, you know, maybe six working days. That, okay. That's very fast. Not everyone should hold themselves to that standard, but that's sure. where some people come in. You know, and so now we're at like four weeks of labor spread out across two people. And then, you know, the letterer is going to come in and a really good letterer will letter a 22 page issue in a day. Wow. Uh, you know, and so it's like every issue is is uh, a month or more of full time labor spread out across a team of people. And you know, so they're they are not easy things to produce. Sure. No, I, I think it's important to kind of mention that. Right. Because I think like. Computers make things a lot faster and easier, but like when you're creating something from nothing, it, it's still a lot of work, right? Yeah, and the you know so there are elements of the process that com- computers have um, really streamlined. Okay. For example, revisions. You know, okay. it's much sure. easier to revise digital artwork yeah. than it is to revise, um, you know, hand done artwork. Uh, 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 traditional is the word that artists prefer. It's much easier to uh, revise digital artwork than it is to revise traditional artwork. But at the same time, you know, the line art takes just as long in either medium. Right. You know, it takes just as, you know, there are just as many lines and just as much time spent planning a composition and just as much time spent thinking your way through it. Um, a lot of the difference in working traditionally versus working digitally, and I think this is true, um, across across every different channel of work where people have you know transitioned from traditional formats to digital formats is that the overall amount of time is more or less the same what happens is that uh you revise on the fly instead of planning carefully and executing all at once ah okay Um, interesting you know so when you're working digitally as an artist if you don't like a line you can take it off the page yeah. when you're working traditionally you you have to have planned all your lines before you draw any of them and that yeah, you know when you're when you're typing in a word processor you can very easily delete a sentence you didn't like and you're typing on a typewriter uh you better hope you've thought through the sentence before you start hitting the keys yeah interesting that's a good way of putting it so if people want to you know pitch comics to you and, and get them kind of under, you know, the vault comics kind of brand. How do they go about doing that? So right now, and for a while now, we have not been in a position where we have the bandwidth to take unsolicited submissions. Okay. Uh, so typically submissions come to us by referral, um, okay. either from agents that we have working relationships with or other creators that, uh, you know, we know and have worked with. Okay. Um, with that said, you know, we, we get requests to submit um, unsolicited stuff on, the, on a regular basis. Unfortunately, for, for uh, you know, for legal reasons, I can't look at anything without um, putting a submission agreement in place. And so I never know whether I'm saying, sorry, I can't review this submission or we can't review this submission to somebody you know, who's doing uh, really great work when it's coming in unsolicited, because I have to, you know, we, we have to sort of draw a line in the sand, focus on the submissions that are coming in through other channels. But we do try at least once a year to open up a window of, of unsolicited submissions to, you know, give people the opportunity to send stuff our way. And when we do that, we usually do it, you know, to coincide with a convention and we'll announce okay. it happening when it happens. Sure, because you guys would probably like, you could spend like somebody it's probably it would probably be like multiple people's full-time job just to go through those kind of unsolicited submissions fair enough to say yeah it would it would absolutely be i mean uh, uh the heaviest months of submissions that we get tend to come right after conventions you know whether or not sure. they're with open submissions and you know we'll we'll get hundreds of submissions in a month and you know if you I think it takes five minutes to review each one preliminarily and then another five minutes to figure out how to reply. You know, you're, you're at thousands of minutes of, of time. Yeah. No, I, I think it, it just makes sense to kind of cover that because I think, like, a lot of people don't understand sometimes. It's like, why won't they get back to me? It's like, well, you like, 
it's not that they don't want to, it's just like they don't have time to, right? Because of like the volume that somebody like you guys would get all the time. And I, I think it just makes sense to kind of cover that. But, and, and I know you guys have a bunch, a ton of stuff kind of coming up, but what's kind of next for you guys? Because in a lot of cases, I, I think like you've accomplished so much in the the few years that you guys have kind of been vault. Yeah, so next for us, um, I'm, I'm in a position where I have a lot of plans laid for next, not all of which can be discussed yet. Sure, that's fine, yeah. Um, we've, we've got some really exciting uh, publishing initiatives coming next year, so we're going to be rolling out some uh, original graphic novels from oh, some really top shelf talent. Like, uh, you know, we've got a series coming from multiple New York Times best selling author, Brandon Sanderson. Oh, wow. Very um, cool. Who's, who's known widely for his Mistborn series and his current series, uh, Stormlight Archive, um, in addition to finishing Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time series. And, you know, Brandon has sold millions upon millions upon millions of books. And uh, I love love the piece that we're working on with him, and I can't wait to roll that out. Um, we've got a whole other publishing line we'll be announcing in the near future, featuring work from you know some really extraordinary Eisner Award winners and New York Times bestsellers. And you know, that I, I think we'll probably have a, an announcement for that next month. We've got some other very exciting developments on the film and TV side. So uh, we, we sold another film option to Netflix. That's and very cool. then we have another deal closing right now with uh, I'm, documents aren't signed yet. And they haven't announced anything, so I, I won't say sure. with whom. But, uh, you know, a major, major, major studio. So I'm very excited about that. Um, we're, we're working on laying the groundwork right now for some partnerships with some very exciting uh, cutting-edge video game companies. Very cool. And uh, we're also, you know, we're we're looking to line up some licensed uh, some licensed titles as well to add to our catalog, and that's, you know, I think for us, something we want to do because we want to do it really well. And that's not to say that other folks who've been out there, uh, you know, producing licensed comics haven't, but um, we, I think one of the things we've established to distinguish ourselves from some of our competitors are just absolutely fiercely upheld editorial standards. And we want to bring that same level of devotion to, uh, some, some properties, you know, legacy properties and current properties that, that we love. Sure. So, you know, we're trying to but we'll have some of those announcements to make for next year uh, as well. But, you know, the, the timing of this interview is such that uh, many of these deals are, are concrete or becoming concrete right now. Sure. And I'm not yet at the point where I can talk about them in detail. No, I think that's good. But people can, you know, go to vaultcomics.com and kind of you guys have a big news section kind of right on your, your site there, right, where you guys are posting stuff all the time. And I think people can kind of check out all the stuff that you guys are, are kind of doing. But but I'm curious to maybe dive a little bit deeper into what advice do you kind of give people that are looking to either to get into the space? Because you guys have done a huge amount of stuff in a very short period of time. So, like, you guys obviously have figured this out, right? Like, how how what do you tell people when they kind of ask for advice on how to get into the space? You know, I, I think that's going to depend on what capacity they want to work in the space. If I were talking okay. to somebody else who um, who said, hey, uh, I want to start my own comic book publishing company, um, I, I would probably tell them to find a job at a comic book company and work there for at least a year so they understand some of the, you know, the ins and outs of the business. It's not as I've learned the hard way, not an easy business to jump into with both feet if you don't know how things work. You know, um, Diamond, who is the the only distribution player in comics, they've been doing this a long time. And, uh, you know, as happens with a great many distributors, they have somewhat dated infrastructure. 
everybody at Diamond works really hard. They do, they do a great job, but they have a really hard job. And just learning how to interact with them in the most fruitful way for you and for them it's, you know, it's a, it's a very complicated process just to learn how to interact with them in the best way. Interesting. You know, so that's like, if I was talking to somebody who was trying to start their own comics business, I would say, take the time, get to know the business. If I'm talking to somebody who's trying to break in as, um, as talent, you know, say as a writer or an artist, uh, comics has an extremely active social media community sure. and comic books uh, have really successfully exploited crowdfunding. Okay. So getting your getting your own work out there in that form is a great way to start building uh, a portfolio and to start building the connections that, uh, that you need. And, you know, just like every other business anybody's trying to break into, you know, cold calling is an effective way <laughs> to knock down doors. You know, you just keep asking people for a moment of their time. And if your work is good, someone will see that it's good and you'll get that first break. And then, you know, don't count on that first break to be the only time you have to do that. You know, it takes a lot of pushing to move sure. things forward. And I think the other piece of advice I would give is that uh, I know a lot of people come into this business with the ambition of, uh, writing their favorite Marvel character or drawing their favorite DC character. And that is a realistic goal for a lot of people, but success in the comic book space happens in all sorts of different ways. Interesting. And, you know, people shouldn't, they shouldn't hold that up as the only standard of success and not be satisfied unless they've achieved that. You know, there are, there are people who've uh, had tremendously successful comic book careers without, ever picking up a, a pen or pencil for Marvel or DC. Interesting. No, that's that's actually really good advice and, and actually quite kind of fascinating, right? Um, so I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts on, it seems like obviously comics and, and the whole kind of space has been around as long as I can remember, but it seems to be the last maybe like five, 10 years, it's become so much more kind of popular and mainstream and you see it kind of almost everywhere now. Would you agree with that? Or, or how do you kind of see it? How, how have you seen kind of the industry evolve over the last little while? So, I mean, comics have always had a major impact on American sure. film and television. And, you know, you can trace this back. Obviously, you know, there were Superman films coming yeah, out yeah, in, yeah. in the 80s, Sure, you know, and they were they were blockbusters then. And there, then there are all sorts of other titles that, you know, I think. Yeah, like the uh, original Batman uh, series. <laughs> yeah, so that and then, you know, there are like a number of titles in the 90s that folks might not even realize were adapted from comic books. So, you know, uh, The Mask was adapted from a Dark Horse book. Right, right. Uh, you know, Road to Perdition was adapted from a graphic novel. You know, we've had so many amazingly successful, critically acclaimed um, pieces of film and TV history have been adapted from comic books. So we've always had um, comic books have always made a big impact on uh, pop culture broadly construed. I think what's happened recently is that um, that that impact has been felt more directly. It's been owned more obviously in the public light. Okay. Um, and then, you know, I, I think that the uh, success of the Marvel Cinematic Universe on a global scale has really, uh, you know, reminded people of where, where this material is coming from in the first place. And then it's just a lot easier to communicate, you know, fan to fan now than it ever has been before. So, yeah, interesting. Uh, you know, fan communities... I, I, I won't say that they're stronger. I think fan communities have always been really strong for various things, but they're uh, a lot more visible now. Right, yeah, interesting. No, that's that's quite fascinating, right? Because the, the thing that's interesting to me about it is like kind of being a child of, well, I was born, I'm 35, just so you have some context. But like, you know, I think a lot of kids kind of my age and nowadays like grow up playing some of their favorite characters, either sometimes they, either whether they're dressing up in real life or playing them online or a bit of both, right? And I think 
and then being able to kind of read and kind of dive into it. Like, I think it's just you have so much more access to kind of being a part of something that you're you're passionate about. Like, I remember me and my friends used to ha like dress up like the Ninja Turtles and run around the neighborhood, right? Like, I like, and those are some of my best childhood memories. And obviously, I watched the cartoon growing up, and and then you saw the movies, and you know, like, and I think you played the video games, and I think that's kind of continued on, but it's just so much better now. Like, the graphics are better, obviously. You know, all the stuff kind of around the whole space is better. Do do you think? Do you agree with that, or is it just kind of a different evolution of that? I mean, I certainly think that it's become possible for uh, film and television and video game realizations of of comic books and other like beloved IP to to be more fully realized. Okay, interesting. <laughs> to 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 be to feel more texturally like the thing that we came to love, and you know. So it, uh, a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles video game now would be so much more encompassing an experience than the arcade game that I was born in uh, 84. I guess you were 83, so we sure. probably played the same arcade yep. game you know, yep, yep, over yep. slices of Jerry's Pizza or whatever. <laughs> um, you know, it, it a game now would be so much more encompassing than that game was then. Um, you know, with, with, that, with that said... Uh, I don't know whether one is necessarily you know, superior to the other, but I think it's a lot easier to to be swept away. Yeah, that's um, fair. Now. Yeah, that's fair. And and you're right, like the just being able to connect kind of globally with people um that are passionate about the same kind of genres and and kind of share new titles to check out. Um, it, it's almost kind of like music in that sense, right? Like you have access to kind of like almost everything, which is like that's been ever created. So something that was created like decades ago can be basically next to something that was like released yesterday. And you have this like access to kind of everything, which to me can kind of be overwhelming, but I also love that, right? And then, you know, one of your friends or somebody you meet online can be like, if you like this, you should check out this, right? And I think that's like the like the almost the coolest thing about kind of the age we live in now with anything. Yeah. I mean, I, I like, I think of this extending across all sorts of areas. It's so easy to learn more about something now yeah. to become, to dive deeper into a thing um, than you otherwise uh, ever, ever might have. And on the one hand that, you know, that's a really really awesome thing to be able to do and on the other hand it you know it can lead to you know, some, some sorts of mania we might we might prefer not to have to deal with sure, publicly that's fair yeah um but i you know i think that i think that part of why comics are so impactful right now is that as a medium uh they've never been better and okay. they may have been just as good uh, in like the heyday of, of vertigo. Okay. Um, but I don't think anybody has ever had you know, better independent comics at their disposal. And, you know, I think that some of the work that the big two have been doing recently has been some of the best work, you know, they they've ever published. Interesting. So, you know, I think that the stories that are being told in comic books right now feel more relatable and, and uh, more emotionally intense than they have felt in a, in quite some time. And I think that's attracting a whole new kind of reader who's interested in these as uh, pieces of serious fiction being told in interesting settings with, you know, unrealistic characters, um, you know, characters whose powers enable them to do crazy things or, or whose backstories aren't, you know, aren't those of the actual world who are nonetheless relatable and, and, and uh, real characters. So, you know, I, I think the medium is, is at a creative height right now. It hasn't been at in quite some time. And uh, I think that makes, you know, makes the stories feel more powerful and feel more accessible to a whole category of readers who might otherwise not have come to the medium. Yeah, interesting. So I'm kind of curious, you, you've 
you're doing stuff kind of in the TV kind of um, space and, and moving these characters kind of off the page into real life. How much kind of um, creative control will you and the artist have? Or is it kind of really dependent on, um, you know, the deal? Or, or how does that kind of work? So that's that's going to depend on, um, you know, each individual deal. Yeah, okay. That's kind uh, of what I, think, I figured. I think as anyone who has ever structured a film or uh, negotiated a film or TV deal will tell you if you don't have it, you can't get it. I see. You know, if you haven't already done a thing yeah. uh, in film and TV, it's very hard to get any movement. Um, so each deal we sign gives us a better position than the last one. Gotcha. You know, and that's, that's just the way it works in that business. Um, with that said, you know, I know that sometimes I'll, I'll talk to a, a comic creator who's thinking about uh, signing a deal with us and they'll say like, I don't want anybody else to have control over how my work is realized in, in film or in television or in a video game. And on the one hand, you know, like I, I earnestly hear their concerns. And on the other hand, I think, you know, like someone who owns and operates a business, I, I exercise a lot of control over the, uh, the work that we publish that sure. we pay for you know we we have our editorial sensibilities and our editorial team and you know i think that that's justified by the fact that we're paying for it when i have a film company talking to me about spending millions and millions of dollars to make a movie from you know from my work um you know from our catalog uh, it, it doesn't seem unreasonable at all yeah from my perspective for them to say we really want to influence what this what this is ultimately going to be like before we put it in the market. Sure. No, that's fair. And I also think too, that like, um, just being like kind of coming from a creative background myself, like unless you understand truly the medium that you're moving into, there'll be things that you want to do that aren't possible. Right. And, or, and they might not be possible because they're actually not possible or you don't have the time or money to make them possible. So I think like figuring out where you, you need to make trade-offs, which sucks. I get that. But like that's just kind of the reality that every medium has, right? And there's not really a way to control that. So I, so I, I guess I'm saying like I agree with you, right? Like it's hard to say like if you're sp somebody spending millions of dollars on it, obviously they're going to want to say, right? Yeah. And then, yeah, I completely agree with you. Like comics are an extraordinarily powerful medium uh, when you sort of analyze them formally. Sure. Uh, because you have, you know, you have at, at least two, but really three sort of key formal, uh, formal sets of elements you can play with. And because the reader is experiencing this actively rather than passively like a film viewer, yeah. you can also you know get them to change their pacing and move around and force them to, you know, like reverse read order and all sorts of things like that, that it's almost impossible to do in, in, you know, pure prose and almost impossible to do on the screen. Sure. And, you know, so comics are extremely powerful. And as a comics reader, if you expect other media that are differently powerful but don't have the same formal elements involved to tell you the story in the same way, you know, you're, you're, uh, I think, you know, misjudging what different media should do. I agree with you completely that, you know, like we should expect each realization of something to be good by the standards of its own medium, not, you know, good in comparison to its original uh, IP. No, that that makes uh, a lot of sense. But uh, we're coming to the end of the show. So let's maybe close with mentioning where people can get more information about Vault Comics and check out all the kind of different uh, comics you guys have. Yeah, so our website, vaultcomics.com, is a great place to start. And that'll link you to all of our social media. We're very active on Facebook, uh, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, you know, all of our books are distributed to comic stores through Diamond. So you can check out, you know, the Diamond Previews catalog online on print to learn more about our upcoming releases. Um, we have a, a great website called Book It that enables people to pre-order our titles through uh, participating retailers. And, you know, 
in, in general, we're, we're regularly covered in, uh, you know, entertainment news. So sure. we're, we're out there to find whenever you're looking. And uh, we're, you know, distributed through hundreds of stores domestically and internationally for comic books and, you know, every major bookstore uh, on, on the graphic novel site. Very cool. And you guys also have some uh, free issues on your site as well that people would check out if they, you know, are interested as well. We do, yeah. So if you go to vaultcomics.com slash free first, uh, you know, you can you can find them there. And we, we regularly update what's available there. So, you know, we'll, we'll be putting up some new titles actually in the very near future. Very cool. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show. And I look forward to keeping in touch with you and have a good rest of your day, man. Yeah, it was great to talk with you. I, you know, have a, have a happy Wednesday. Thanks, man. Okay, bye. Take care. Bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website at buildingthefutureshow.com to join the free community, sign up for our newsletter, or to sponsor the show. The music is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.